uh, Chair of our Board of Trustees, Mr. Zakir Mahmoud, uh, AQU President, President Dr. Suleiman Chahabuddin, <laughs> our very special guest, uh, Dr. John Dirks, uh, Provost Carl Amrine, um, all the senior leadership of our university, especially our Gardner Awardee, Professor, Distinguished University Professor, Dr. Bhutta, all the faculty and students gathered here in this auditorium, and especially those gathered on Zoom around the world, including from the Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto, Canada. Assalamu alaikum, good morning to you all, and good afternoon to us here in Karachi. As you walked in, you heard uh, a uh, instrumental of a uh, Pashto folk song called Bibi Shireen. And that was being played as an ode to the song that was played when Dr. Bhutta uh, received the Gardner Award in the ceremony just about a month or so ago. We are so thrilled to have you all today here uh, as part of the Gardner Award lecture series. Uh, and uh, this award was given to Dr. Bhutta, and you're going to hear much more about it. Uh, in, to, to celebrate the incredible achievements he has had. Uh, to begin today's proceedings, I will ask uh, President Soleiman to come give the opening remarks. President Soleiman. Bismillah rahman rahim Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Adil. Uh, our guest of honor, our chief guest, distinguished professor, Dr. Zulfikar Bhutta. Uh, Dr. Dirks, we are so pleased to have you back on the campus with us and to be physically present uh, to celebrate Zulfi's success with us. Uh, Dr. Lindblad, who is also here, uh, welcome. Uh, our provost, Dr. Carl Amrine, our dean, uh, Heather, Colleagues and friends, including those joining us from East Africa and from around the world. Uh, you know, at the first take you convocation of our medical college, our chancellor, His Highness the Archon set AQ what today we might call a stretch goal. He told the audience he wanted the university to serve the most vulnerable of God's people. More specifically, he said, he wanted it to become one of the world's resources in the health problems of mothers and children. And whose work will be on the frontiers of knowledge. A tall order for a university which at that time was only six years old and far removed from the world's knowledge centers. But there was a young man, a young man in that audience who heard that statement and felt his own values and ambitions embodied in them. And today, in large part because of him, we can say, we can proudly say, that the Aga Khan University is indeed a world resource in maternal and child health, whose work is expanding beyond the frontiers of knowledge in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in, in East Africa, and beyond. That man is, of course, our very own Dr. Zulfikar Bhutta. Dr. Bhutta has spent his life working to improve the fortunes of the most vulnerable, namely women and children living in poverty. Not from a distance, but on the ground and in person, in areas where many fear to tread. He has succeeded by bringing science to bear upon the health problems that people face in their daily lives. He has developed and rigorously tested interventions that are now being used across Pakistan and beyond. His work has informed international guidelines for the treatment of multiple diseases. His research has helped to make nutrition an international priority and to put community-based interventions at the center of health policy. Dr. Bhutta's reputation is global and his influence is global and they have been for a long time. We were thrilled, extremely delighted when he was awarded the John Dirks Canada Gaidner Global Health, 
Health Award. And I had the pleasure and the honor uh, of being in Toronto on the 27th of October uh, when this award was presented to, doc to Dr. Bhutta. And I cannot, cannot even express, cannot even tell you what a proud moment it was for me uh, to, to be the pres to, as the president of the Aga Khan University to be in that audience and to see Dr. Bhutta receive that, that wonderful distinguished award. We all know that the Gardner Award is the capstone so far of an illustrious career and an honor made all the more special by the fact that it bears the name, name of our former dean, Dr. John Dirks. You might say that 2022 is the year the award came home. Oh, wow. But while we were thrilled, we were by no means surprised. I don't know if Zulfi has a trophy room, but he might, he might need one at this point. Yet, you know, I think that his greatest achievements is not a, is not a technical one. Zulfi once spoke in the landset of the multiple dimensions of poverty. He singled out one aspect in particular, one you might find surprising. He spoke of the poverty of hope and the poverty of imagination of people who think there are no innovative solutions. And he made it plain, he was speaking not of those who live on a few dollars a day, but of the fortunate. Zulfi's impact reminds us all that science is not something that is confined to a library or a laboratory or a hospital. It is something that is meant to intervene in society and change the world for the better. His struggle has been not only with the poverty of means that plagues the poor, but the spiritual and intellectual poverty of those who think that nothing can be done to improve their lives. The Chancellor, His Highness the Aga Khan, has said that where hope takes root, great achievements are possible. Zulfi is one of those in whom hope took root and blossomed, giving birth, giving birth to new solutions, to a, to a new generation of scientists cast in his own mold, to a center of excellence that is highly, highly regarded around the world, and above all, to an evidence-based optimism regarding the difference that we can make in people's lives. On behalf of all those whom you have inspired, Zulfi, it is my pleasure to say thank you. All of us at the university, all of us across the countries, Pakistan, East Africa, Afghanistan, all of us across this region, and all of us across this world will eternally remain grateful to you for your interventions, for your research, and for your scholarly activities, and for flying the flag, and really uh, thinking of the, of the vulnerable population, the women and children in this world. Thank you very much, Sulfi. Thank you very much, Mr. President. We have something very, very special that's just about to happen. Before the John Dirks Gardner Lecture is presented by Professor Bhutta, we have John Dirks himself here to introduce Dr. Bhutta. This is a very rare, rare occasion where the person who's, who, who an award is named after actually introduces the awardee at such a great level. Now, as mentioned by the President, Dr. Dirks is not new to AKU. In fact, he was our provost, uh, he was our rector and dean between 1994 and 1996. And for those of you who are doing the math, yes, that is when myself and several of our associate deans and, and department chairs and many others were students. Now, Dr. Dirks is from Manitoba and he graduated medical school there in 1957. He had a storied career, including being uh, division chief, department chair at UBC, and then dean of medicine in Canada before coming to AKU in 1994. After he finished his time at AKU, he went back and became the head of the Gardner uh, organization and also started the International Society of Nephrology and had a huge impact on international and global health. He also lobbied Canada's government 
to make this Global Health Award. He ran that for more than 20 years, and in honor of his incredible accomplishments, they named the Global Health Award after him. So Dr. Dirks, we are so thrilled to have you back here at AKU. Thank you very much, Dr. Heider. It's a real honor and pleasure to be back here. And I've been treated royally with wonderful hospitality. And it's uh, particularly uh, encouraging and uh, to see the great progress that has been made here from uh, over the last 25 years uh, as an institution. And uh, one has a feeling that the morale is high and that uh, the future remains great despite uncertainties that are worldwide and, and uh, perhaps in this country as well. So uh, what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about the Gairdner Awards, what it means, uh, and uh, how it is that the Global Health Award got established, and I'll point out that uh, uh, who received it before so you could tell the company of major movers and shakers of global health uh, now include uh, Zulfa Garbuda. So I'm going to put on the first slide. I was first involved with the Gairdner Awards in 1982. It was been started by a Toronto stockbroker in 1959, and it had as, a, as its main mission to honor scientists, usually basic scientists, who uh, made a key discovery that was seminal. And uh, those award, that award has been called that time uh, the uh, Gairdner International Award. And later when we received the money from the government of Canada in 2008, we added the word Canada in front of it. So uh, during my first uh, t uh, 11 years, uh, and I was on the adjudication committee and we used to come from Vancouver and so on. And uh, it was an excellent adjudication committee and many excellent scientists were picked. I became president just before I arrived here in 93 and was able to do this just as a small part-time job. And the, the future of the Gardner Foundation actually in the ensuing few years looked a bit bleak because the family money was running out. Uh, it was strictly a family board and there was no other, they didn't want to anybody to fundraise. But so here, let's put on the first slide. So I started, became president in 93, and it was just a part-time job. And uh, as soon as I got back to Toronto uh, in late uh, 96, I realized I had a big job ahead to deal something about it with the funding. Uh, the family had always been against the fundraising, but we managed to convince them. And we started uh, major events, and the funding gradually improved. But as we got into the late 2000s, we realized that something more had to be done. The prizes were only $30,000 a piece. We were giving five or six of them a year. And uh, so we went to the government of Canada under a conservative government with Mr. Harper and persuaded them in three months with 36 meetings that they should give us $20 million, which has given Gairdner the sustainable ever since. So now it consists of five uh, international awards, which are largely, I say, for basic science, for discovery science. We have a Whiteman Award is for a prominent leader who's built science in Canada. And then we started the Global Health Award. And I have to say my time here in Pakistan kindled my interest in, in, um, in global health, seeing the, the uh, varied conditions that were in this country regarding health, and also I was made the uh, chair of the uh, International Society of Nephrology Global Commission dealing with nephrology. And uh, so simultaneously building that up gave me much exposure to some 70 countries where I recognized need for global health. Interesting, so we started in, in, two, uh, in 2009 with the first award having received the check from the government of Canada. and. Uh, it relates to giving uh, uh, the best biomedical uh, global scientists uh, an award of $100,000. It's 
Usually it's not shared, but sometimes it is. So our goal is to recognize uh, human health overall. And at the bottom, you can see Gerdner has up to now given 402 awards uh, from 40 countries, and 96 of them have gone on to uh, receive the Nobel Prize, including one who received the Global Health Award. So it's a record that's uh, closely matched by the Lasker Award in New York, but the Lasker Award is 15 years older and has a greater longevity. So all of this is a, really an outcome of excellent nominations, but particularly strong adjudication carried out by an international uh, committee which has representatives not only from Canada and the United States, but from uh, quite a few European countries and Japan and Australia. And that has served us well. Uh, next slide. So this is this year's awards. And I just uh, want to point out one, two things. One is uh, I'm just going to focus on the international award which was given to the mRNA vaccines. Drew Weissman, who's on, uh, face on your far left, uh, two persons over to the right is Carico, uh, Catalina Carrico, also from the University of Pennsylvania. So they were the key people in using uh, microRNA to produce the vaccine. But a British Columbia scientist, Peter Cullis, who's furthest second from the far right, your far right, mastered the way you could introduce that mRNA through uh, nanoparticles into the cell. Because otherwise, it would be destroyed. So that was a very important associated contribution. So the next slide uh, defines the award in particular, which, uh, as Dr. Heider just mentioned, uh, when I retired in 2016 from the Gardner Awards, uh, was named after me, and I was very honored to have that happen. So they recognized leading scientists, researchers who have used uh, rational scientific-based research to improve the well-being of those facing health inequities worldwide. And it's been very infectious disease-oriented so far. Uh, next. So here's this year's, uh, here's a series of, uh, or some of the previous awardees. On your far left at the top is Peter Piat, who did uh, major work earlier on in AIDS and Ebola, and is currently the director of the School of, of Hygiene and, and Tropical Medicine in London. Uh, I will, uh, on your far right at the top is Tony Fauci, who is familiar to almost everybody in the world, and his contributions to infectious disease are phenomenal, uh, having uh, worked particularly in AIDS. He's led the PEPFAR program that convinced then President, the younger George Bush, to fund about $7 billion a year for AIDS treatment in Africa. And he, he was, a, was a marvelous visitor. And uh, on the bottom at the far right is uh, Victoria, Dr. Victoria, who uh, was a major person in improving the health of children in, uh, in Brazil, largely through uh, uh, dealing with malnutrition and, and enhancing the use of breastfeeding. Next slide. Now here at the top left is Professor Omura from Tokyo. Uh, so he was a major microbiologist and uh, he uh, cultured various uh, it's collected samples of microbes all over the world. And uh, he found one um, that uh, had unique properties uh, and eventually led to the isolation of the chemical avermectin, which is the cure for river blindness. Uh, he took his sample uh, uh, within a few feet of a golf course, which he often uh, played, and uh, uh, and it turned out that, that was the only sample, the only microbe ever found that produced this important drug. Uh, this drug got a little bad publicity because Donald Trump said it was good for COVID, but, but it's, uh, in fact it's not, and uh, in fact uh, uh, caused a number of uh, side effects. But the, the millions of blind Africans who've been treated successfully 
uh, 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 point out the value of that drug. So he, uh, he, he, he got the Nobel Prize along with uh, uh, another scientist from Merck who uh, worked on some of the science of the drug. And also at the same time, a Chinese uh, doctor got the, uh, had a, shared the award for her discovery of the drug Artibus used in malaria. Uh, on your, uh, here at the, uh, at the, uh, at the very top at the far right is Bob Black, who contributed extensively to the study of malnutrition worldwide in children. Uh, and here in the middle we have uh, Greenwood, who was the person who fostered early protection from malaria bites through nets. Uh, and uh, I think I'll, I'll just stop with those. So it's been a collection of outstanding people. And you can see that uh, is the crowd that uh, Dr. Buddha is now associated with, minor or major. And I think you can all agree that he's in an excellent company. And all of us wish we could only join them. Next slide. So just mentioning very briefly what are the diseases and so on that uh, the Gardner Award for Global Health has, has honored. At the top, you have the papilloma virus, which uh, now that we have the vaccines, is r rapidly eradicating cervical cancer. Uh, we have a mental health care in low resource settings, which received an honor. We have, I mentioned, Avermectin, uh, the key drug that uh, has uh, uh, cured river blindness. We had several in the HIV field because it's uh, had so much uh, research support and was so devastating in the 80s and 90s and now is under control. We had malaria prevention. Uh, with, uh, with Greenwood, but I also should mention Nick White, who was from Oxford and worked in um, Thailand for years. He's the one that really showed that Artemisin worked. The Global Health Story by Murray and Lopez, showing countries of pa like Pakistan, what is uh, uh, your various burden of various diseases, and so on. So, and uh, we go with. Uh, uh, SARS, which was uh, mentioned to two uh, scientists from uh, Hong Kong who isolated the virus. So it's a very important uh, collection of scientific discoveries and applications. Next, please. So this year, Zulfikar Buddha, your star, received the award for the development and evaluation of evidence-based interventions in child and maternal health for marginalized population, focus on the outcomes for the first thousand days of life. And you can see uh, the picture of uh, our MC on the far left, uh, Summer Wedlock, or chair of the board, Heather Monroe Bloom, Zulfikar. I sort of snuck in. And we also we have the ambassador for Pakistan to Canada, uh, Mr. Jan Jua. Next slide, please. So what Zulfikar's career is, on the, is summarized on the, on the far right, that he's one of the most highly cited scientists in global health that there is. He is uh, ranked among the top 1% of highly cited researchers globally. He was already a recipient of the World Health Family Health Award, the World Academy of Science Award in the Medical Sciences, the Rue Prize, also 100,000. Uh, for its impact, and very important, he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the Royal Society, it's actually the Institute of Medicine. And he leads large groups, both here as you know well, but we're always very happy that you shared them so well with the Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto in the last decade or so, and he's had an equally large impact there. And here on your left, you can just go, that uh, he's a man not without honors. Uh, I always hesitate to carry his suitcase when we go flying because his CV is very heavy. <laughs> Next slide, please. So, as mentioned by Sulem, there was a great gala in Toronto. So on your top left 
is, of course, the very engaging assembly of AKU representatives. And uh, I met them all there that evening, and uh, I think it was, uh, uh, everybody was, uh, uh, found it a joyous occasion. Uh, we mentioned the, that uh, Zulfikar was introduced by this particular music piece. Uh, I was involved in starting that years ago because we said we needed something extra. And uh, uh, most of the award winners spend more time thinking about the, what music piece they should select, often six months of, of intense deliberation uh, as compared to preparing their talk. You know? uh, so then we have here at the lower left is uh, uh, Zulfikar's family. And it was also a time, I might say that, but it was very sad and I, that uh, Zulfikar had lost his colleague and, and wife, Shireen, who played such a role in all of his studies. And they, so he, they all came well represented to be with him a, a movement that was happier. And you also see part of his family there on the top right. And on the lower right, uh, at the bottom, is uh, a rather uh, sizable group at the Sick Kids Hospital, and I hope they're all watching on this Zoom call. So uh, I think that completes my introduction, and I'm going to ask uh, Zulfikar to come up and give his talk on the, the future of maternal and child health. What does it mean for the world? What does it mean for Pakistan? Zulfikar Buddha. Okay, so since the secret of this particular slide has gone, because it's been flashed 10 times, I'll, I'll uh, I start by saying, imagine this is almost three decades old. This is 1995, and several of my mentors and colleagues are in this photograph, Bulenblad, I'm so pleased to arrive from Sweden and join the occasion, Dr. Bulu, who has been like a father figure to me. Uh, but you will notice that apart from a number of young people and excited faculty members are the graduates from the neonatal intensive care unit that we have looked after over this preceding period. And peering on top here is John Dirks. Because as rector and dean at that time, he oversaw and helped us in terms of bringing an academic flavor to the university. So John, I hope over the last few days, irrespective of the fact that you only spent two years here, you've seen how that seedling of academia into a university which was ripe for that kind of an intervention at that time has led to its growth and, and how for the people who know you from that time, how highly regarded and loved you are. You'll also notice that it's a very young version of me, and, and a lot of these accolades, which are frankly so embarrassing, are showered upon me as if I do everything myself. I've done n nothing alone in my entire career. And as many of these young people here uh, are present, the work is largely done by them, and to them truly belongs the honor and the accolades of work over time. But as my team knows, and I do want people to understand, that my entire career was always a partnership. And very few people recognize what an important influence Shireen played in my life. Not only was she a life partner, she was a thought partner, a soulmate, a moral compass, uh, for almost half a century. And again, uh, the confession today, she was instrumental in my coming back to Pakistan. As I told some people last night, I was actually headhunted by AKU in 1982 by Sheriff Smythe. It was a couple of years before they made up their mind whether they wanted to start clinical service, and I was debating whether I should go to 
California or come to Pakistan and Shireen was instrumental and when I when she saw that I was dealing dalling she actually packed her bags and left a little ahead of me <laughs> but she spent all her life and her career in doing exactly that in serving the poor women of the country in building capacity and I'm so deeply honored that many of her colleagues are here today and that they have with the government gone ahead to name the center that she had helped establish in her name at, at General Postgraduate Medical Center. I, I wish to dedicate today's presentation for those people who are here and who are watching from afar, including uh, many colleagues of Shireen's, uh, to her. And to give you an essence of what an amazing individual she was, that while desperately ill and perhaps unable to even communicate properly, just a few weeks before she passed away, uh, she asked me, why don't we say something about the floods in Pakistan? Because we had written a joint paper on that in 2010. And that precipitated this piece in the Lancet that was published posthumously after, after her demise on the floods and their impact not only in the short term or in the long term on women and children of Pakistan. So thank you, Shireen, if you're watching from up there or afar. Uh, thank you for half a century of companionship and the love and affection that you gave me and my family. So I've been asked to speak about the future of maternal and child health and what does it mean not just for the world but also for Pakistan. I'm going to try and do justice to it in the time that is available. But look at the future, you have to look at the past because people who forget what has happened in the immediate and distant past are condemned to repeat some of the mistakes that have been made. So Jorge Santillana had said this in the context of many things that he saw in front of him in the post-war world. And to address some of these issues, let me take you back close to around two decades ago when people assembled, and I was invited to join them, in the Rockefeller Center in Bellagio scenic location of Lake Como. And I don't quite understand why development agencies in particular want to meet in the most beautiful places in the world to consider some of the ugliest problems of the world. But they do. And I had no idea why this meeting was called till I got there and I was invited principally to participate in the consideration of why child health had not changed in the world. Since the time of Jim Grant, at, who was one of the late leaders of UNICEF. And amongst the many things that we produced was this infographic, which is probably the most influential infographic in that decade. This was the map that we were able to generate as a map showing where 10 million children were dying every year in the year 2000 died. Each one of these dots represents a cluster of 10,000 deaths and as you can see, most of these deaths are clustered in Sub-Saharan Africa, and South Asia appears as a red blob, largely because of its population density. This was around the time when people were waking up to the Millennium Development Goals. They had been coined, they had been signed in the year 2000, but nobody knew where, who they were. So if you read our Lancet series on this particular topic, we don't quite mention anything about the MDGs because it, was re it had really not percolated up into the global conscience. But it was a very important milestone that the world had set itself with an ostensible two-thirds reduction in child mortality by the year 2015 and three-quarters reduction in maternal mortality. We did what we could for advocacy, evidence-informed advocacy from the work that we had done at that time. And we were very fortunate, largely because of the community-based work that we'd initiated here, that we were asked to come and contribute to it. Well, the rest is history. Why? Because by 2015, the world had indeed reduced child mortality from a 12 million deaths annually in the year 1990, the base year, 
to less than 6 million deaths by the year 2015. And if you take the population increase into account over this period, the world achieved MDG4, reduction in child mortality. This is one of the fastest reductions in mortality for both children and mothers in the history of mankind. It happened because a few people were able to do the evidence-informed advocacy, move governments, move mountains, get them to invest in interventions, get them to invest in reaching the unreached. And that's not a mean achievement. And we were very fortunate to have been part of the movement. But was it all milk and honey? The person who put a dampener on some of those achievements was none other than Tony Lake. In 2017, no, in 2010, actually, Tony Lake stepped down in 2017 when I met him uh, for the first time. But in 2010, when he took over, he called his staff members and said, what's happening? And they told him, you've made this spectacular achievement and this gain and all. And he made this statement in one of his first speeches. I remember reading this because this was read out at the Women Deliver Conference in DC. Um, and I was quite shocked at how perceptive this was. Uh, what he had said was that these statistical averages, the gains that we were being shown, hid behind them the ugly truth that there were tremendous disparities and there were people who were left behind on the basis of poverty, ethnicity, conflict, migration, etc. And a lot of people don't understand what did he mean. And let me try and explain that with this particular graphic. So on this slide, what you see on the x-axis at the base are countries who have reduced mortality, and on the y-axis are whether they have done that through an increase or a reduction in inequality within their populations. So I want you to see particularly the red dots. These are countries that have had a tremendous reduction in mortality, but at the cost of a tremendous increase in inequality within and people don't understand how can that happen. Well, absolutely that can happen. Why? Because just like the top 1% of the ultra-rich can pull a national GDP average up, just like access of care to the rich, the more fortunate, to those living in urban populations, to those who have education, can lift the national average and leave the poor behind. And that's the principle of how to target and reach the poorest of the poor, the most marginalized, has to be at the cornerstone of global development. And it wasn't during the Millennium Development Goals. These figures, these statistics, these data only came out towards the end. So that tells you there were many blind spots in our knowledge, wisdom, at the time when these MDGs were coined, crafted, and followed. So what were the other blind spots? So one of the blind spots, as I mentioned, is that development and impact was unequal. And you can see this very clearly as to how, on a global average, the global reduction in child mortality was largely pulled by China, some countries in the Middle East, and Brazil. So these three, four countries with millions of people, large populations, did indeed do very well. And they pulled the rest of the world with them. But if you look at Africa here, and if you look at parts of South Asia, the reduction in mortality wasn't as impressive. We were also very interested to look at other permutations, other non-geographic, but other groupings. And as some of you know, I've had a long-standing interest in how did the Muslim world, the Islamic world, do in this. And we analyzed and published some of this work in The Lancet, showing that for many things, as you see here, both maternal and newborn mortality reduction, the child mortality in Muslim majority countries was lower than the average across non-Muslim low and middle income countries. And so was newborn mortality reduction. Muslim countries did not do too badly. But then you turn to maternal mortality and all of a sudden the whole thing reverses. Maternal mortality rates in many of these countries were significantly higher than those of other low and middle income countries. And that started 
the quest as to why should this be the case doesn't make any sense. It is not related to socioeconomic conditions because many of these countries are far better off than countries in sub-Saharan Africa. And the penny drops when you look at the coverage of interventions and the inequity in terms of various countries. So these are Muslim countries where you've looked at the continuum of care across pre-pregnancy, pregnancy, childbirth, and beyond. And lo and behold, that the lowest performance or the worst indicators that we have are around reproductive health, family planning, adolescent health and care. We could publish it because I had a group of academics, including many women academics, including some from Aga Khan, lead that analysis to show how we need to focus on some of these fundamental issues in our own geographies and world. So as I've already indicated, the two extremes of childhood were missed. We missed the fact that newborn mortality was so high and that a lot of these deaths were taking place very early. But also, adolescents were completely forgotten in the Millennium Development Goals. Nobody talked about them. Nobody knew that they existed. As part of the UN Secretary General's independent expert group that I was honored to serve on, we made this observation, but it was too late for the MDGs. This was made in 2014. And when you begin to unravel some of this, you recognize how important this is in the context of global development. If you look at the proportion of girls who become mothers before the age of 18, either within marriage or outside of marriage, that is disproportionately clustered amongst the poorest of the poor. And as you will see early on, this is hugely important in the context of low and middle income countries and also some of the geographies that I've spoken about. And then we also discovered pretty late and it was too late for the MDGs that there was something missing in the middle. And what was that missing middle? These were school-age children. And if you look at the mortality in school-age children, as we've just published last year, globally, close to around a million deaths are in children between 5 and 15, where there should be no deaths. Why? Because they're not vulnerable. These are children who have passed the danger period of the first five years. So we've recently looked at this in the context of Pakistan with the National Assessment and Survey of looking at, we talk about maternal and newborn mortality, child mortality all the time, looking at what happens to school-age children, young adolescents and older adolescents. So I'm showing you those data for the first time. So first of all, for children in Pakistan, and this is a national level representative survey, which was done two years ago, what you see very interestingly is that between 10 and 15 years of age, you have a tremendously high proportion of deaths due to trauma, accidents, and injuries. And even amongst girls, that proportion is about a quarter. And compared to boys, you see a relatively higher proportion of infectious diseases that kill this age group, which shouldn't. The proportion of infectious diseases that kill 10 to 14 years old is generally minimum all over the world. But yet, 10 to 14 percent of all deaths in children between 10 to 15 years of age in Pakistan are related to infectious disease. I was very keen to find out what was happening to adolescents. So let's look at 15 to 19. Again, 15 to 19 year old boys in Pakistan die predominantly because of injuries, accidents, trauma, some NCDs of course. But when you go to girls, about a quarter, 27% are dying of causes that should not exist in that age group. They're dying because of obstetric maternal conditions. And that is why we need to focus on adolescent health. And that's why we need to focus on ensuring that children don't have children. Because when they do, they have a disproportionate risk of mortality. There were other contextual drivers. But we were not, at least I was not aware of them at the time when we did the work. I ran into a publication, and this is for the young people in the audience, the importance of keeping yourself abreast of what is happening. And sometimes in the most esoteric places where you typically would not read scientific journals. So I ran into this paper by uh, Marshall Burke, 
and colleagues which, who had done a fabulous analysis of uh, geospatial variations in child mortality in Africa. And they made the point that the real variations in child mortality were subnational. This was published in Lancet Global Health. But then when I read through their analysis, three things jumped out. They had looked at a range of uh, DHS data sets from 28 sub-Saharan African countries, 1998, 1980 to 2010, and they had looked at those mortality hotspots that you just saw, and this found that the mortality, both within region and across boundaries, was related largely to three factors. One was predictable for Africa, malaria, but two others, which were drivers of these mortality hotspots, had not been pointed out before. One of those was local temperature, and the other was conflict. So, I was, of course, very acutely aware of the conflict relationship, war with child health, with mental health. We had worked in Afghanistan. We were quite aware of how it was overflowing the boundaries, etc. But that paper, that one paper, stimulated a tremendous amount of not only introspection, but also thinking as to what can we do about it at a global level. So I was able, very fortunate, to persuade people that this was worth getting together, and not only with money, as was pointed out, money is one factor, but money is not everything. Money has to be accompanied by ideas and firing the imagination of people. So I was able to put together a consortium, and it's a dream consortium in many ways because it has all the Ivy League universities coming together. Johns Hopkins, London School of Hygiene, Tropical Medicine, uh, Stanford, GWU, Aga Khan, and they all agreed to be coordinated by our center at Toronto, which is again not a not a, a natural thing to happen with these Ivy League universities. And we formed the consortium called Branch Consortium, which is the Bridging Research to Action in Conflict Settings. The idea was to look at this in depth, to determine once and for all whether or not this was a big issue and what were the solutions. So it was a solution-oriented work. It was published as a series in Lancet two years ago, and it made a number of startling observations. So first of all, in terms of numbers, we were able to look at Africa in great detail and do geospatial analysis to determine exactly what proportion of deaths were related to conflict. And the proportion was about 20 times more than what the global burden of disease had suggested. And we were able to determine this through geospatial uh, analysis and no modeling that, first of all, there was a geographic relationship of conflict with mortality, that the closer populations in health centers were to conflict, mortality rates were consistently higher and remained higher. The other thing that we showed that both for maternal as well as child deaths, that there was a, a lingering impact in terms of perturbations of the health system. And therefore, in addition to direct deaths, there was an indirect impact through health system disturbance that was not quantified. We were also able to use that model to make recommendations for interventions which were hitherto not part of the humanitarian uh, uh, lingua, which is to say you have to cluster interventions which are a little different close to the epicenter of the conflict, and you have to cluster interventions a little differently as you go out to more stable populations. And those recommendations in the Lancet hopefully have seeded a lot of thinking around how to develop packages of care for both acute as well as long-standing conflict. Now, I'd mentioned climate change, and I do want to say a word or two about climate change because that work is just beginning. We had understood from Marshall Burke and Iran Ben David's work that this was important, but how do you, how do you begin to understand this? So let me start with an example from Pakistan. So Pakistan has a huge burden of childhood stunting. 40% or thereabouts. This is based on our, our group's work, the National Nutrition Survey, which firstly looked at this at subnational level. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to work out that there is a gradient from the north to the south. Much of the stunting is clustered in the south. 
And even in some of these areas of synth, which are close to the river, an agrarian, still very high rates of clustering, of stunting. And the reason is very simple. Land, tilling the land or producing staple foods does not mean that you have access to the produce. So a lot of this has to do with food security in those given populations. The other thing that our survey showed for Pakistan was that there's a very close link between maternal nutrition, this is data on low maternal BMI, 18.5 wasted women, <clears throat> things that my obstetric colleagues see all the time. Um, Dr. Halima is here, and she knows that in their center, as Shirin would tell me, there would be often women with hemoglobins of less than four or five or six who would be coming in for delivery. So maternal, in, maternal malnutrition has been a very important driver of maternal mortality. But what people didn't recognize is that if you look at the child, morta child stunting and wasting together, there is such a close homology between the two. You could make these maps overlapping. So maternal and child undernutrition are very closely intertwined. Now the question is, what are the major drivers of this? And we had done work before on what is driving stunting in Pakistan and looking at various factors. But the one new factor that we hadn't figured in and was climate change. So <clears throat> in work that we did in collaboration with a young University of Toronto uh, a PhD student, Harris, uh, this is the map that we generated on what has happened between 2018 and 11 in terms of surface temperature change. And I could use, show you similar maps for water security. The question is, how does this relate to the question of stunting? And the answer came in the multivariate analysis where you look at this and you see, in addition to everything else that's predictable, economic, maternal education, these things that drive improvements in childhood stunting, the more educated you are, the more wealthy you are, of course, your rates of stunting are low. But look at the influence of three things that you see at the bottom. And Mr. President, this is the reason why I was talking to you about family planning today. The link of maternal parity, having multiple pregnancies, multiple children, leads to maternal depletion, high rates of stunting, and high rates of fetal malnutrition. And what we did not recognize, at least I did not know, that there would be a huge impact on this of climate change, on stunting. And that brings me to mechanisms. So we don't quite understand. We haven't yet done the work. Some people, including Anna Bonnell, uh, in this paper just published last week uh, in Lancet Planetary Health, has looked at this in Gambia and has been able to show that even in some measures of exposure, women are significantly more exposed to heat when they work in rural populations, just like they do in Pakistan. And you can well imagine that if pregnant women are working out with ambient temperatures of 40 degrees centigrade, how that can have an impact not only on their health, on the health of the fetus. And that's our, our forthcoming body of work that we are initiating in relation to climate change, maternal health, and child health. But then something else happened, and the world did indeed come to a stop, and that was COVID. So in the midst of all of this thinking, uh, we did have this interruption of the sustainable development goals. And it's amazing that I stand in front of you today and look at these figures, 651 million cases of COVID worldwide. And nobody's testing for these anymore, so you can well imagine most cases now are silent. But we've lost about 10, we've lost about 7 million, 7, you know, billion people people. Number of deaths due to 7 million deaths is not small. And while we've put interventions in place, it's important to recognize the cost of COVID. So some of that cost is direct and some of that cost is indirect. And this is one of the challenges we have to face as we look forward. So our group uh, at Sikids, in collaboration with AKU, 
undertook an analysis of COVID impact with UNICEF for South Asia. And I'm going to show you some of that data. And of course, we had waves of COVID, not as high as many other places, but certainly a lot of COVID cases here over the period of time with these variants. But we were focused on what had happened in the early stages of COVID with the stringent measures of lockdowns and school closures. So the lockdowns and absences had a clear impact on health systems. And over the quarters that we have seen here, very clear reduction in terms of coverage of interventions in, across uh, the health system. So I, people neither sought care nor were their health providers, and that had a big impact in terms of coverage. But on schools, by March 2020, people had begun to close schools. And by May, this was absolute. And then it took an enormously long time to reopen schools. And as you can see, even up to January 2022, schools hadn't reopened in many places. Bangladesh only opened schools towards the summer, um, early part of the summer. Now, why am I telling you this? Why is the pediatrician talking to you about school closures? The worst possible thing that we could have done in this pandemic was this, is closing schools and keeping kids out of school. And I regard that as one of my own personal failures because I pleaded, exhorted, did everything that I could with the NCOC here in Pakistan to request them not to close schools. And if they did, to leave the primary schools open for these young children who had no other option but to go to school to learn because they could not learn by Zoom and the poorest of the poor had no access to what assets the rich people had. Now we estimated with black and white from data as to what had happened in South Asia and particularly on girls. We estimate that close to around four and a half million girls dropped out of school in South Asia. And, and you can well imagine what happens to a 15, 16 year old if she's out of school for two years or more and sitting at home. We estimate that there were about half a million excess adolescent pregnancies in this period with consequences that will be lifelong. But in addition to this, there were also significant impacts on mental health. This is a recent review that's been led by Leela Harrison in my group and coming out in the BMJ, where we have looked at the prevalence or increase in anxiety disorders and depression in school-age children and adolescents, and these figures are alarming. And this all happened in the wake of school closures. So the one lesson for this is we should never do this again. If there is another pandemic, this should be the last possible solution. And I was disappointed even recently when people were asked this question, and the knee-jerk reaction from three African policymakers in this big global health conference in Brussels was, oh yes, we should school, close schools. Um, so, Lots of lessons to be learned by looking at recent experience. Now, I want to change gears now in the, in, the, in the little time that I have, talk about solutions. So how can we bring about change and look at what works? And there is a lot that can be done. And there is a lot of need because despite the fact that we achieved the Millennium Development Goals, ostensibly, there's still close to around 9 million deaths if you go from early childhood to children in school and adolescence. So there is an unfinished agenda. And to do that, particularly in the context of Pakistan, you have to understand where the barriers are. So virtually hot off the press in the sense that we've just finished this analysis today, I want to highlight three scholars in, in the audience in collaboration with the NIH, the National Institute of Health Research Pakistan, um, Ayaz Guerrero, Imran Choudhury from my group, and I don't know whether Arjuman is here or not, I asked them, I challenged them last week to take data from our National Unitation Survey and look at if we had data on sentinel signal functions for maternal and newborn care in Pakistan. And the survey that we have done over the last year is looking at the apex public sector hospital in every district of Pakistan and the apex private sector hospital in every district of Pakistan. Now, we couldn't survey every hospital, but let's say, take your illustrative figure from the best public sector hospital, generally the district headquarters hospital if it exists, and the public sector hospital 
whatever exists for maternal and newborn care. Now I'm going to show you some graphics that I have also not yet fully digested, but they are alarming if they are what they are. So these sentinel functions are 20, uh, three, 22, and we have 21 of these with the absence of retinopathy screening in our survey. So first of all, if you look at public sector facilities for obstetric signal function compliance, uh, you can see very clearly that there are many districts where we have not even two or three of these functions available. And they range from skilled birth attendance, blood banking, facility skilled care, etc. But the important thing I want you to see is what is the private sector capabilities in many places. So Balochistan virtually disappears because there's no private sector in Balochistan. Tremendous human resource shortage out there. Now, one would have thought that newborn might have been a little better because there are more pediatricians than obstetricians in many places. But actually, newborn care has just been completely off the grid in Pakistan. And when you go to the private sector, again, very limited and completely non-existent in many parts of South Punjab. So targeting and focusing on filling some of those gaps in these districts is key. And that is exactly what Zahid Mehman and Saad Sufi and his team have done as part of this large project that we've been doing for the last several years in a population of about 16 million in this New Hope Only They Know project. And I want to show you some results in terms of our intervention. So first of all, on the equity issue, you see a tremendous increase over time in the coverage rates for the poorest quintiles. So the poorest quintiles are in red, and you see over time how they have improved in terms of the intervention change in coverage. Mortality rates have gone down in districts, but despite the reduction in mortality rates, the other thing that you recognize is that we still have differentials within districts of mortality. That much of this mortality that we still have is clustered because areas which are a little further away from district headquarter hospitals, like this red one, typically have higher mortality rates, and that's another barrier to climb. But we have the solution here because we've had 20% reduction in neonatal mortality in these intervention districts, working with the government and working on interventions that are part of the government thing. The next futuristic thing is addressing the thorny issue of stunting. What can we do for stunting? And here I bring you evidence from our global work before I talk about Pakistan. This is looking at exemplar countries, countries that have reduced stunting by more than 3 to 4 percent per year over time. And you will see that they do not consist of rich countries. These are countries like Ethiopia, Nepal, uh, Peru, uh, Kyrgyzstan. And if you look at these countries in terms of how they've done it, to cut a long story short and look at the decomposition analysis of drivers of change, a number of interventions have made a difference. But they consist largely of three buckets. And those buckets are, firstly, direct health sector interventions at the top, maternal nutrition interventions, health interventions, reducing fertility, family planning, but also indirect interventions that have to do with education, environmental health, and also women's empowerment. So it's important to underscore that even though the trials may not show it, but water sanitation hygiene is a very important intervention to reduce undernutrition. Now, we may say all the things about Pakistan, and all um, um, averages may be belied the fact that there are pockets of the country which have done better than others. And I want to show you data on what has happened in Pakistan in some regions on stunting reduction. So here is a map between 2011 and 18 of how stunting rates have gone down in certain regions. Ignore the south because they haven't gone down in the south. But if you look at KP, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Punjab, and you compare 2018 with 2011, tremendous improvement in childhood stunting at subnational level. 
I don't have run the stats for you to tell you how that has happened. And we were very keen to see how has that happened? What drove it? So if you look at the drivers of stunting reduction in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and, North, and, and parts of Punjab, what do you see? You see wealth, economic improvement, and social safety net. The Benazir Income Support Program, which was targeting women as a major driver, almost half of all stunting reduction in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Punjab can be attributed to economic gains and particularly empowerment of women, economically or otherwise, through the income support program. And there are others also. And we were similarly interested in looking at maternal anemia, there, where there has been improvement also, notably in, in the middle and south of the country. May not have been dramatic, but you know, went down from iron deficiency anemia of 25% in women of reproductive age to 18%. And if you look at what drove it, it's almost the same things. Economic improvement, women's empowerment, you see the contribution of health as well as nutrition intervention. So it can be done. And this has happened in parts of the country. So those looking at how we can bring about change need to look at what has driven change. But we are now in the sustainable development goal era, and the challenges are huge around this. And, uh, and these challenges relate to the fact that health is no longer an isolated sustainable development goals is intimately linked to the other goals, including climate change, including environment, including gender parity, including social determinants of health, education, etc. So what can I leave you with in terms of where are we going? And what is it that offers us some hope for the future? So <coughs> just before COVID hit, I had managed to assemble another consortium and this time around, some of the same suspects were some new ones. We brought them together and we took them to address one of the ugliest problems that still existed in the same beautiful location of Bellagio, which was the bribe that I could offer them, to consider how we could make a move forward to improve child health. Note, not child mortality, improve child health overall. And we generated over this period of time, and I do want to stop for a second and pay a tribute to two people who were fabulous friends and colleagues and died in this process. One is Pete Salama from WHO, who was the head of their emergencies, and Pete died during the COVID pandemic, and Josh Patton, the adolescent health expert, who just passed away last week. So we worked together with these as a consortium to produce a series in The Lancet looking at how do you optimize child health and development across the life course and improve human capital. And I'm not going to go into the details of the recommendations, but it came up with one very important um, graphic illustration of how we should look upon child health and development in the context of the entire period from zero to 20 years of age. Just like as parents, we don't divide our children in terms of how much attention we give them when they are babies or when they are toddlers or when they are school age children or adolescents. We look upon this all as a continuum. Yet when we come into the health systems, we look after them when they are under five and we forget about them afterwards. So this particular graphic looking at nurturing care framework from a very early part of life to school age and, ad and adolescence is the driving force which has now led WHO to adopt this and to develop this into a program which will be clustered and layered also on existing and future school health services. But this was not enough. And a lot of people would ask, well, why stop at 20? I mean, it is, life isn't over at 20. And for many of us now, we realize that it isn't over. But we wanted to do the same for women's health and well-being. And to do that, you have to realize that some of the biggest challenges that women face are not necessarily in the reproductive age period where we look at them through the lens as of, of just childbirth. But menopause and beyond offers a huge opportunity for intervention because they are so vulnerable. So our idea was to look at health and well-being across this continuum. And to do this, we assembled also a consortium and looked at a number of domains that you see up here. 
And I just want to show you some graphics to make the case that we have been able to look at how exemplar countries emerge who have invested into various aspects of health and well-being dimensions, not only in health, but also in nutrition, education, and work, and also in empowerment, access, and poverty dimensions. Uh, this is work in progress. We hope to complete some of this work by the middle of next year, and other will flow into 2024. And I hope that this will guide a lot of the women's health agenda as we go forward. As I finish, I want to turn back to Pakistan and talk a little bit about success stories, particularly for the young people in the audience that we don't quite talk about. So I've talked about inequity. I have talked about disparities. I've talked about how our health system does not deliver. But there are also glimmers of hope. And one of those is what has been possible to introduce as part of the Sehat Sahulat program in parts of the country. This health insurance program, even though it targets curative services and not primary care services yet, covers the entire population of Khaibur Pakhtunkhwa. It has been achieved without an additional dollar in taxation. It covers all families up to a million rupees per year, which is not an insubstantial thing. And it's open. I mean, I have had the great fortune of going to them and asking them for data. For data. And I was very interested in what is happening to gender parity in the province that I come from and I know is one of the most gender in unequal provinces. So here are data from the inception to now. Zainab, you may be interested in this of the numbers of categories of procedures and admissions since inception, and there are more women than men in this. So where the government and the people want, things can be done. And they can be done with the same resources that we have, and more important than money, because the money has gone out of the system that exists, was the human resource of thinking through innovations and coming up with solutions like this. So let me finish by saying that we stand on the shoulders of giants, and some of them are here in the audience. And I've been very blessed over the years of not only having leaders at the university academic level, but also within my own program, people like Poo Lindblad, Kafar Billu, Majid Mola, uh, who's now in Bangladesh. And as I give you this award lecture, I want to pay them a tribute for having faith, confidence, and holding my hand when I needed it to be held. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you, Dr. Bhutta, for that uh, tour de force. And it just goes to show to everybody here what it takes to win such an incredible award and make an impact to humanity. This, of course, last hour has been about academics. And we are so grateful that the chief academic officer of our university, Provost Carl Amrein, uh, is with us. And he will be uh, making closing remarks. Provost Amrein. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Dr. Buddha receiving the Gardner Award in Canada a few months ago was an extremely proud moment for AKU and the country for many reasons. It recognized one of our own as an accomplished biomedical scientist and recognized his contributions to advancing human health. It also highlighted our institution and nation at a very prestigious global stage as you heard from John Dirks. The exposure and opportunities such accolades create inspire others to also reach for these achievements. It motivates our young healthcare professionals and aspiring medical students and researchers to strive for excellence, to recognize that hard work, 
dedication, and passion can lead to glorious and celebratory outcomes. Thank you, Dr. Buddha, for being that guiding light and that role model for so many who will one day follow in your footsteps and achieve greatness as well. Dr. Dirks was inducted into the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame in 2012. His work has been impactful and seminal in many parts of the world, including within AKU. In 2010, Dr. Dirks received a Lifetime Achievement Award. Twelve years on, he continues to astonish us with his intellect, skill, ambition, and sense of purpose, and willingness to fly around the world on short notice. We are honored at your presence at AKU once again. Also with us is Professor Bo Lindblad. He was chair of pediatrics when Zolfi was a very young physician and played an important role in convincing Dr. Buta to strive for the PhD. Uh, Professor Lindblad is the architect of the very successful AKU Karolinska program that has provided I understand 16 of our colleagues with access to the PhD program. And many of our stars that are still with us on staff are the graduates of this Karolinska program. And we are reviving the Karolinska program, Dr. Lindblad, with help from our colleagues in East Africa this time. Thank you to the team that has worked to put today's event together. Thank you to our audience in person and online and to the entire community nationally and globally that continue to support our vision. We hope to continue to learn from the very best and to share our experiences amongst ourselves and with the world. It has been an evening well spent and with the cause of maternal child health in the hands of maestros like Dr. Buddha and his team, the team he keeps referring to as the very young team who is in the audience, we can be hopeful and brave that the future, in fact, will be better than our current condition. Thank you all, and good evening. Thank you very much. We uh, uh, will now uh, move on to the poolside for refreshments. Uh, once again, congratulations to Dr. Buddha, and thank you all for making such a wonder of fun come alive. Thank you.